Well, today being Mother's Day, often times in the past, um, I grew up certainly recognizing moms, and uh, I was told many, many years ago by a, a very dear friend of mine, a, a fellow pastor, who said, Mother's Day is that day when we talk about how wonderful and glorious our mothers are. And Father's Day is the day that we talk about what dirty, rotten scoundrels the men are. I have really tried not to do that. And because of where we are in this text, as we think about working through Deuteronomy chapter 6, and today being a day that we will also dedicate our parents and children uh, at the end of this service, the beginning of the next service, what I really want us to focus on is more on the idea of, of what it means to be a parent and a grandparent. And so we will do that. We've been working through this, this chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6, with the theme and the title of the series being, Love the Lord Your God. The first week we talked about having a good grasp of our own identity and, and God's identity so that we can understand where we stand in relation to Him. And then last week we talked about the idea of what it means to love and, and why we love God. Today I want us to understand and think about if we really value that, if we really believe that it is truly what we should do, that, that the greatest command really is to love God, and Jesus said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. He quoted the Shema that David just prayed a moment ago and that we talked about last week. When he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, that's it. And so if that is the greatest commandment, then we ought to really understand how important it is. And if it is important to us, then it is our responsibility to pass that on and to instill that in our children and in our grandchildren and those that we may have influence on as aunts and uncles, all of those things, this idea of family. And so that's what I want us to focus on this morning is the importance of truly passing this on. As I said last week, Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. We have to pass this on. And so I want us to think about this today. And, and as we look through this text, uh, we'll be dealing with verses 6 through 9. Then I'll read them in just a moment. But I want to give you what the, the points will be through this, our time together, through this sermon. The first is name. We need to name those things that are important. And then secondly, we need to instill those things in those that we have responsibility for. And then we need to reinforce those things in the way that we live. So be listening for those things. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I believe this text is really the pivotal text of, of, of this whole chapter because it teaches us the importance of passing this on and he says, these commandments that I have given you today, he names them. In chapter 5, he gives us those, that list. I want to read them to you quickly, paraphrased here. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your, your mind. And the second one he said is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you really take these 10 that I just read, each of those falls into one of those two categories. Loving God and loving others and how we react with others. And so he did name these things for us the importance 
of the greatest commandment, I think we can see here, this greatest command to love the Lord your God with all that you have, the, with all that you are, is to be on your heart. We're to teach that to our kids. We're to talk about that. We're to, to have them in front of us all the time. We talked last week about this idea when he says to, to bind them around your forehead or on your arm and write them on your door frame or your, or your fence post. That, that idea of the phylacteries that they would write the Shema and roll that up and put it in a pouch and tie it to their head or tie it to their arm. They would put it uh, in the manusa on the door or on the, on the gate post. That constant reminder that we are to love God with all that we have. And beyond that, to teach that to that generation coming behind us. The love of God is to be the central interest, the central focus of our lives, the pivotal, most memorable thing that we should do every day. In fact, every morning we should get up and say, God, I want to love you with all that I am today. Will we be perfect every week? We talked about this last week. We're not gonna be perfect every day with that. That's why every morning we wake up and we say, God, today, I wanna do my best to love you with all that I have in the way that I live, in the way that I serve. For us today, what Jesus teaches us is more of fleshing out what we learn in the Old Testament. We as believers, as Christians, we are bound by a new covenant. And so Jesus gives us that idea. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, this that I just read, this that's in the Old Testament. He said, I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill it so that you understand it, so that you know how to live it. The Ten Commandments are still crucial for us today. I've talked to people that say, well, I'm, I'm no longer bound by the law. I, I, I live under grace. That is very true. But these are still the guideposts, those, those guardrails we talked about in the first sermon of this series that keep us on track, that help us live in the way that honors God. But Jesus helped us understand what it means to keep them and how. Jesus also taught us things like the first will be last and the last will be first. He who would be first will be servant of all. In fact, Mark chapter 9, verse 35 says that very thing. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Jesus taught us to treat others with respect, to love all people, even our enemies. I made a statement a few weeks ago and I've heard someone say, uh, and I believe it was on a Wednesday night actually, as we were talking about loving one another. Do you realize that God loves your enemies as much as he loves you? Let that sink in for a minute. As you're sitting there, you're thinking, that can't be true. God has to know what type of person that person is. I mean, how could God love that person God loves everyone the same. God loves your enemies as much as he loves you. We are to love. Jesus said, you want to be different? You want to follow me? You want to be my disciple? You're going to love. Keep my commands. And my command I give you, he says in John chapter 15, love one another. That's how people will know that you're my disciple. Because you're loving people that some people wouldn't love. We're bound by these things. This is what he calls us to have in our hearts, these commands to have in our hearts and to impress them on our kids, to love all people, to live humbly, to surrender, to submit to God in all things. The New Testament adds these pillars of our faith. We just read and know the Shema. We've been talking about it, the Lord Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. God is the one and only God. Not only only, but unique. Oh, none like him any other way, any other place. This God is the only God. And Jesus, we know him from the New Testament, is his one and only son, who was in the beginning, John chapter 1, who created all things. Jesus, the very one and only Son of God, came to earth, deity incarnate as human. He lived among us. He was sinless. And he who knew no sin took on our sin and died a death that we should die. 
to pay a price for our sins that we couldn't pay. And then after dying, three days later, he rose from the grave and he conquered sin and defeated death. When we believe in him, when we place our faith in what I just said, what the Bible teaches us about who Jesus is, when we place our faith in him, he saves us, he forgives our sin. And we have a relationship then with him and a promise of eternal life with him forever. Now those are the things we need to name for our kids and our grandkids and those that we have influence over. These commands that I give you today, Moses says, are to be on your hearts. We are to impress them on our children, instill them in their lives. But we have to name them. We can't be afraid to name what we believe. And if we truly believe this, then this should be important to us. And when it's important to us, we have that responsibility to pass it on, to instill it. Growing a disciple begins with naming expectations. Have you ever tried to do something where you were trying to, to please someone else and they had asked you to do something but they didn't give you any instruction and you didn't know what the expectations were? How frustrating is that? We can't tell our kids, be good, and then walk away. What does that mean? We've got to name these things. Growing a disciple begins with naming those expectations, and then it leads to instilling them in our children's lives. When we name the expectations for our kids, we begin to impress and instill them into their lives. And not just our children, but our grandchildren and our, our nieces and nephews, those that we have some influence over. We're called to this. We are called to make disciples. Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God. The greatest commission is making disciples. That's our marching orders. That's what we're supposed to do. That happens first. That happens best at home. We are to instill these things in our children. Let me just tell you, there is a danger in our society today, and I see it even in our own church. And I'm not pointing anyone out, because I am not perfect in this either. But there is a danger in our society that says, I'm just going to let my child decide what they believe for themselves. Now that sounds very inclusive and very empowering, doesn't it? But think about that, carry that out to the fullest extent. How many of us would take our three-year-old child, put them on the front porch, and say, the world is a scary place, but I believe in you, do your best, and then shut the door and go back in the house? How ridiculous would that be? That child is not equipped to do what's necessary why do you think we have school? We have to teach our kids how to survive. It is even more important to teach them to honor God. It is even more important from an eternal standpoint to teach them the elements of faith. And so to have this idea, now let me, let me just say, there will come a point in each child's life where they need to own their own faith and work through those things. But without the tools to do that, how can they ever arrive where they need to arrive? That is our responsibility as parents. That's our responsibility as a church to raise up kids to follow Jesus. Now, will they make their own decisions? Yes, but we need to give them the tools, and we don't just turn them loose at age three and say, figure it out, you'll be fine. That doesn't work. It's our responsibility as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, as friends, as church, to help raise the next generation to follow Jesus, to to name those expectations, to teach those truths, and to instill them into their lives. Faith development must be steered, it must be taught. We're commanded to do this in this text, to impress them on our children, to talk about them when we sit at home, 
to talk about these truths when we walk along the road or when we drive in the car, to instill these truths from the time we wake up to the time we lie down. We are to keep these truths in front of them as part of daily life. It's not just something that we do on Sunday. It's something that we do every day. This text tells us, keep these, these commands that I give you, keep them on your heart, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. He's telling us this is how we do this. We instill these things, impress these things on our kids. Give them the tools that they will need to make the decisions when it comes time for them to make their own decisions. This is our responsibility as parents and grandparents. It's our responsibility as a church. And that's why we have adopted two or three years ago this vision as a church to empower families, empower homes to make Christ the center of the home. We've talked about this, and I don't want to get too far down this road, but, but so many of us have this idea that, yes, I want my child to know Jesus. I want my child to follow Jesus, but I'm going to give them to the church and say, here, you teach them. This happens best at home. That's why this vision that we have adopted is so important to understand that as a church, our responsibility is help the parents. And yes, do our part to help with the kids, but, but we have them one hour out of 167 hours as a church. Have you thought about that? I have a, a if you don't know this about me, if you've never been to my office, I have many sicknesses, uh, one of which is for some reason, years and years ago, I began to collect coasters. Am I right? One of those coasters on my desk is, a, is actually a, a marble tile, and it has the, the phrase on it, one out of 167. That's a reminder to me that as a church, on a typical week, we have your kids for one hour. You have them for 167. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to help you understand the weight of the responsibility. As a, as a church, our responsibility is first and foremost to grow and help parents turn around and help their kids. This happens best at home. We are to instill these truths in their lives as a daily practice, not as just something that happens on Sunday. Think about this for just a moment. When Jesus was questioned, what is the greatest commandment? He turned immediately to the Shema. What that tells us is his parents did what this text tells us to do. Jesus was raised that way. By the time he was able to, to talk and walk along for himself, he was lost at the temple when his parents were a day's travel away because he was already doing this. His parents had raised him to understand the importance. Now, yes, Jesus was God and man, but his parents had influence on him. And so I just thought that was an interesting thought that Jesus turned immediately to this text because he was taught, just as this text tells us to teach. So we need to name these expectations and then we make disciples by continuing to instill the truth in them on a daily basis. But let me just tell you the third point is we have to reinforce this truth. We have to reinforce it. We don't just tell them one time and say, here are the things that you need to know. I'm gonna write it on a three by five card, keep that in your, in your drawer, in your dresser, and just remember these things. We have to keep instilling, keep reinforcing. But let me just take a side note here and say, when Moses says this in chapter 6, verse 6, he says, let these commands that I'm giving you today be on your hearts. They need to be on your hearts. Raising Jesus' followers starts with you and with me. These truths are to be on our hearts. We need to be doing our best to know the truth and keep the commands ourselves. Kids have an innate ability to read fakeness. Have you thought about that? Maybe you haven't seen it. I've seen it. 
Kids can see through fake in a heartbeat. If our lives don't reflect what we say, they see it. We need to be doing our best to know the truth and keep these commands. It's why it has become our vision as a church to help each of us grow in our faith so that we can have something to turn around and give to the next generation. It starts at home. And truth is caught as much as it is taught. It takes a true disciple to make a true disciple. Let me say that again. It takes a true disciple to make a true disciple. We can't give what we don't have. We can't teach what we aren't learning ourselves. We have to reinforce what we are teaching by living it out every day. Does your life reflect what you expect your children to do? I will tell you the old philosophy of education of do what I say, not what I do, that doesn't work. Never has, it never will. We have to live out what we are teaching them. We have to be the example. And so not only are we to name these expectations for them, we're to know them ourselves. And we're not only to instill them in our children, we're to live them out ourselves. That's how we reinforce what we are teaching. And we need to be consistent. Don't look to me as the model father. I have made mistakes. Granted, thank God, my children are pretty much grown and they're doing okay. But we are called to be consistent. We won't be perfect, but we're called to be consistent and to be faithful. One of the things that we have done in years past as a church on Mother's Day is to recognize those mothers in the room who were maybe the oldest mother or the mother with the most children. Uh, we learn through experience that doesn't always go well. <laughs> and so we stopped doing that several years ago. But I wanna stop for a moment thinking about this idea of consistency and faithfulness. And I have permission to do this, so I don't think that she'll hit me, maybe. But we are blessed this morning to have a mom in the room who next month will turn 100 years old. Virginia Lee, it is so good to have you today. It's good to have you back. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. She's trying to ignore me is what she's trying to do. And she's here with two of her children. And so uh, you are an inspiration to us. You and your husband both, OB, were both so faithful to this church, faithful to your faith. And, uh, and thank you for that as an example of uh, being this consistent and faithful example of living out your faith, of humble service, of humble generosity. Uh, we have to live this out. We can't just tell our kids, this is what you need to do. I'm going to go do this, but I expect you to do this. We've got to live it out and be consistent and be faithful. Making a disciple happens by reinforcing the truth. So as we close this morning and move into this time of dedication of our, our children and parents, I want to give you this challenge. Commit to do your part to name and instill and reinforce the truth of God's love and Jesus' salvation. That's our responsibility. Live it out as we teach our children what is expected. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word and the way that it reminds us of what we are to do, the people that we are to be, but also how it lays out the responsibility of passing this on to the next generation, to our children and our grandchildren. So I ask that in this time, uh, you will help us to, to remember the importance of doing just that. But help us also to remember that we can never give what we don't have. And so I pray that today we will re, uh, reaffirm our commitment 
to live this out, to learn what it means to follow you and to live it out every day so that not only can we teach our children by word, but we can teach them by example of what you expect. Find us faithful in that. In Jesus' name, amen.